Hi, uh, welcome. This is on this emergency state of the art Facebook Live, and I'm Elliot Fishman. And Mahadev um, Mahesh, I'm a medical physicist at Johns Hopkins. Okay, so why are we here? So the reason we're here is some of you may have read yesterday, and this is something been talked about for a little bit, but it was in the New York Times, which is always front and center, about patient shielding and the changes in patient shielding. So Mahesh is one of the people quoted in the article, has been doing a lot of work on it. And I thought he, we would go to him and let us know directly what's happening, what's changing, and what should everybody know. Um, what happened is like back in uh, April of this uh, last year, um, the American Association of Physicists in Medicine uh, came out with a position statement stating that uh, gonadal shielding is not much use. And in fact, sometimes it can be harmful. And the same thing can be generalized to overall patient shielding in general. Um, immediately, there is like some opposition. However, a lot of the societies have endorsed. The first one was to endorse was the American College of Radiology. They endorsed this uh, position statement. Along with came the Canadian Association of uh, Radiologists and the Physicist, Australian Association of Radiologists. All of them have endorsed because most of us know in the field that uh, sometimes when we shield the patient, uh, to a large extent, it's done for psychological purposes. And to a lesser extent, it's basically protecting the patient. Um, especially gonadal shielding. This has been an ingrained concept for a long time, especially the technologies are taught even in the school. There are questions on their, essay, um, on their board exam to shield the patient. However, what we are increasingly seeing, and we have multiple publications and reviews, what we're seeing is like sometime these shields um, are causing uh, more radiation dose to the patient. Why? Because Imagine an abdominal x-ray of a child and the technologist places an apron under the tummy on the gonadal area. If the child kind of move when we are taking an x-ray, the shield can show up on the image, which in turn re results in almost repeating the x-ray. That's one case. Second is with a lot of these new technologies, um, with the digital technology and automatic dose exposure control in CT, if the shield comes in the path of the beam, the x-rays can be even higher than what it was supposed to be. The other aspect is like, um, we know that there is internal scatter with any X-rays. That internal scatter is not protected. So in general, what we, wrote, we, we have been discussing is um, this, we need to move away from the gonadal shielding and also any type of patient shielding. On the other hand, one can use good collimation, good techniques to make sure the dose is minimal. So we had a lot of questions about this one. And recently I was kind of um, uh, called by this writer uh, who did not tell that it was for New York Times, but um, you're, supposed, just, you're supposed to ask. Yes, but she was writing, actually this article was for Kaiser Health News Network. Actually that article is published in the Kaiser Health News. And she went on discussing about this with a bunch of us, including Rebecca Marsh. She's at AAPM. Dr. Rebecca Marsh is another physicist who's leading this effort at the AAPM. So when she talked to her and she also talked to me about What's the situation with the dental lab, um, the radiation protection of shields in the dentist? And uh, the concept is even in the dentist, all of us get dental x-rays and we see there, the, share, the dental hygienist put on a big apron on us when taking an x-ray. Fine, even though it might not provide any direct comfort or protection, it provides a comfort because the dental dentist area is cold, so you feel comfortable. However, increasingly what we are seeing is like, with the 3D dental imaging coming on board, if these shields are not placed properly, it can actually interfere in the image and that can show up in the image. They might end up taking the um, taking the x-rays or the, the 3D image again. Already this article discusses, they contacted the Dental Association. They have in fact a position statement not to use a, um, uh, aprons uh, in the uh, uh, abdominal area when they're taking a dental x-ray. However, they were insistent on taking uh, using thyroid shields. However, we strongly believe even using a thyroid shield, especially when doing a 3D imaging, can interfere and cause more trouble. So having all said, this is said that there seem to be some resistance and public are always concerned. And one way to tackle this is we need to have more education material. In fact, AAPM has now a working group. Uh, it's called the AAPM CARES group, which has representative from um, radiologist or uh, ACR from the ASRT. So we have radiologist on the team. We have technologists on the team and the physicists are working out to come up with the educational materials um, to educate the 
um, the technologists, the radiographers, and the public. So, you know, no, I was going to say, as a scene yesterday, it was interesting, and we posted that article on CTSS, and yeah. many people saw it. And there were a lot of comments, and you know, it's it's funny also. Once you do something for so many years, even though it may not be that you know times change, we've learned more. People are very resistant to change. I think that's the problem. I, I absolutely agree because that's not going to happen in over, overnight. Even at Hopkins here now, we have a small working group um, trying to uh, educate our pediatric de department, not the pediatric radiologist, even pediatrician, um, informing that we will stop using the shields. And they are alarmed at the beginning. But because this is has been going on for so long, technologists are taught in the school. And in fact, that has to change now. And eventually, even ASRT, which does the registry exam, may have to take off this, some of these questions, which is about patient shielding. But it's going to take some time. Meanwhile, rather than being very much um, um, negative about the whole concept, let's look at the science. Let's look at the publications, which clearly shows example where it interferes in the path of the baby. To, to, to one of the beneficial part of it is like, um, at the same time when the AAPM announced this position statement, FDA came out with a new regulation. Actually, they had in the regulation about patient shielding, and in fact, they have changed. They are introducing a change in the regulation. Right now, that regulation that, that they are that's in comment period, and they expect to have these comments received by September of this year. Hopefully, they'll get they'll they'll have better information to make a decision to change the regulation. There is one other area which we I think it still need to be tackled. That's it because. More, many of the state regulation which monitors x-rays also have in their books about patient shielding. So that also has to be tackled. Like for example, in Maryland, which is an agreement state, we do have on the books about patient shielding. However, they also give a caveat that as long as it does not interfere with the patient imaging, then only we should use. So they give it, they give kind of an option for technology not to use it, but still it's there. But as you know, when people are used to something long for a long time, change is always resistance. There is a resistance for the change. And I'm hoping this type of education material will answer to the public, not just wave off the hand and tell them we should not use apron. In fact, the APM statement, and we also believe that ultimately, in spite of all the mater educational material, if the patient insists that they still need a shield, it will be provided. It's not that it will be banned. It will be provided because the patient has the ultimate uh, right. request, and we'll do that. However, we're trying to educate it that it's of less use. Right. So I guess the biggest challenge mm -hmm. will be for the technologists in the sense that they're the ones who deal with the patient. Exactly. So now you, you have a five-year-old, and you have the mother in the room who maybe she had her old. The other kid had an X-ray before and had shielding, yeah. and you know shielding. We always said you know sometimes it's one of those things that not that it helps, but it makes you feel like you're doing something. So. Exactly. What you know? So, what do you do to the? What do you tell the technologist who's the patient? Says, you know, listen, we've always had shielding. I've heard shielding is good. Do you know what you're doing that you're not using shielding? I, I mean, how do you answer that? Yeah, I'm glad you asked the question because uh, we had to answer this in a multiple way. Um, the questionnaire is coming out. FAQ is coming out. Like for example, here, what the effort we are trying to do is like, uh, one of the best way um, public will ap appreciate is by reading a comic books. So, as you know, and we discussed in previously. Um, we are trying to develop a comic story, like a one-page comic strip, which will have a conversation between a mother, a child, and a technologist. And they will have a conversation going, telling like why they are not, why when it was used in the past, why they are not using it. So we're trying to tell like um, why we should not be using as a conversation level. We are hoping that this comic will help. In fact, we are going to do a study um, of this pre and post comic story to see whether it really changed any mind. That's one thing is coming. The other one is also another story about uh, between the two technologists, one who has gone come back from the conference, know about these things, and one who, do, who doesn't, and they are resist talking about these things. So what I strongly believe is like we have to do multiple approach, not one way. And in a way, I'm glad this New York Times has agreed to publish this article because, as I said, I did not know or the writer did not tell me that it was published in New York Times, but even she was surprised when New York Times picked up the article and published. Now, because it's in a wider world, more and more people will be at least have an option to take a second look at it. So, so if you, so let's, let me ask, so if you're a technologist, yeah. you know, so you spoke and then there's the New York Times article and everything. If you're a technologist, a radiologist, or even a patient, and you want to know more about this and 
how this decision was reached. Is there any place that you would recommend people go? Yeah. Um, the best place right now is like um, American Association of uh, Physicists and Medicine, AAPM, has a web page about the position statement and all the material, useful materials along with it. And that web page is freely accessible. And it can be start looking at www.aapm.org. In fact, we can make an effort to link that web page through the CTSS.org yeah, and the ACR image widely in other places, but that is there. In addition, on top of it, as you can see in this article, um, um, Image Gently um, uh, coordinate Dr. Don Frush is also interviewed. So it also tells that Image Gently is also behind this effort. In addition, the National Council of Radiation Protection Measurement, NCRP, is currently working on a, on a statement commentary on this particular issue and they're going to be publishing pretty soon at the same time we are coordinating now i'm coordinating with my colleague in britain where in uk also the medical physicists are working out to come out with a position statement with more detailed information why we should not be used it so a lot we are trying to do a joint effort globally so that we're not going to cause confusion okay. um, so everybody works to provide the same information and trying to educate not only the technologists but the patients and the radiologist and the physician together. Okay. Now, now there was one question. Let me see. Someone had this question, so I'll read it. You mm -hmm. can see it. Sure. Uh, this is from Radtech 1985. This is on their Instagram, so if you're on Facebook, you sure. can't see it. And also, if anyone has any questions, this is the time to ask because we're gonna, we're finishing up. But here is a question: We put shields under the patient for our cath lab heart procedures. I still think it is an important radiation patient patient safety factor. Would, would you recommend that? Has that been discussed at all? Um, under the patient or over the patient, again, it supplies the same thing. Anything on the patient shielding is not necessary. Because the reason, I'll tell you why. Because especially in the cath lab, if you're placing under the patient, and and with the, with the fluoroscopy being automatic exposure control, and if the X-ray beam, by any chance when you're patient, the, uh, panning the patient, um, the shield comes in the path, the X-rays will tell like, okay, there's more attenuation, so it's going to generate more X-rays that can automatically increase more radiation to the patient. The, let me, the other area which I strongly think is like to make a dis distinction or at least to avoid confusion is this particular position statement is only about patient shielding, nothing to do with the staff shielding because that's right. what another question. Oh, then should we stop shielding the, uh, mm -hmm. using the apron for the shield? Mm -hmm. No, that is different because the staff was standing around the patient or working around the patient and they can be exposed to scatter radiation and that is very important for radiation protection. They need to wear the shield. Right. It's only the patient. We don't need to shield. Okay. Here's another question. Sure. So they mentioned that Dr. Oz is not going to like you anymore. The Dr. Oz has stated that patients need a thyroid for a mammogram, thyroid shield for mammography. Unfortunately, even though Dr. Oz is a well rest, um, at least has finished his medical school and he was a surgeon. Two and time uh, ago. And I feel very sorry to call for him or his group to cause a lot of confusion. In fact, this particular question about um, mammography shielding came up a year ago. And in fact, ACR and we, some of us in the ACR, we wanted to go on our show to respond to him and he invited, but they canceled in the last minute. It is very unfortunate because general public believe that us and these people who are in the media has responsibility. In fact, even my wife and my her friends were, were talking about this after hearing uh, Dr. Oz. And then it took me a while to convince. And again, you know, if you are, you're, uh, you're the closest to those who are closest to who you don't believe yeah. unless they hear from the third party. Right. right. But, but what we are trying to say is like, let's look at the science and not that we are trying to do like something like a shady or anything. Actually in mammography, imagine if you put a thyroid shield and the woman is pushed, the breast is positioning. And especially if the head comes in the path of the beam, a shadow of the shield shows up to the breast. And if it interferes the, the area which can have a cancer, Imagine how much damage it caused, and that's the what that's the uh, the worst one can do. So okay, another question from uh, Dr. Ahmed Jisabani. I'm not yeah. sure where they're from, but they want to know is is there any worldwide policy documents from IAEA? I'm glad you asked the question. Um, in what is fact, IAEA? The IAEA stands for International Atomic Energy Agency. Okay. Usually, that is associated with nuclear weapons and nuclear industry with Iran and all those things. But actually, a large part of the IAEA is for world peace with regarding with respect to the health radiation protection. Right. And IAEA does such a good job of reaching out to the countries which has very little limited resources. 
and they provide training and i have participated in a number of training uh, in africa and uh, asia where we with the centers there to train the physicians and the technologists so iaea has not come out anything yet but i believe i'm i'm we, we are in discussing with my colleague at iaea that they they're going to take a look at this one because it's important because apm has come out is good but IAE is even more widely reachable. Okay. And I think AAE is, uh, I'm hoping that AAE will look at the, look this up, take this up seriously. Okay. And then Adrian asked a question. Yeah. What about shielding pregnant patients? Again, the same thing applies. So a lot of the time, we get that question all the time. Right. A pregnant patient comes from a CT or an X-ray and we want to shield the pregnant belly when you're doing a chest CT or chest X-ray, like a, a head CT. So the, the thing is with the patient shielding, majority of it is a psychological comfort. And as long as the shield is below this field of view, and if the pregnant patient wants to feel psychologically comfort, right. use it. Otherwise, the same knowledge applies. There is no much use for the shielding because the internal scatter is not going to be protected by the apron. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges with sure. the whole shielding thing is I think people, when you do it, you feel like you're doing something yes. or you thought of something. I think it's the challenge going to say, oh, we're not doing anything but doing nothing is the right thing yeah. to do. Let's see. Uh, but then the, adding to that point, in fact, when the position statement came out, this is my personal opinion. The 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 radiography society was kind of resistant to that. They kind of, I felt that they took it a little bit more defensive that we were right. telling that they're not doing the right job. That is not the point. We are not telling that yeah, the technologists are doing not doing the right job. In fact, we are one of the best radiographers and CT techs in the in the in the world. And they do such a good job, but that's not the point. But things which is out of our control, like the patient movement, right. uh, is that is the one which is causing trouble. Right. I'm thinking with kids. So yeah. okay. So then I think that's really good. So I think hopefully everybody um, now understands what we're thinking about. I think you know one of the challenges is going to be probably some departments must have things in their hospital policy about you doing shielding. So yeah, that's going to have to change. That's that's another point. For example, here at Hopkins, um, in fact, um, we have a working group. To just look at that one, um, we have, we have uh, that that is led by the the director of the medical imaging uh, uh, school, Sandra Moore, and Peck Cooper, and other other um, other technologists are involved to see what we can be changed because that's again the hospital policies are there. So so let's 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 be practical at Hopkins now. Yeah. Are we have we thrown away all our shields? Not yet. No. The reason is we don't want to do a, like a day and night change and without doing a lot of confusion. We want to go at it systematically. We have done a lot of working group, met a couple of times. We have met with the pediatrician. We are trying to bring them this whole thing and trying to tell them that we are not doing something which is going to ca cause trouble to their patient. But I think in a six months or something, we're going to make a decision to change completely. But until that, in spite of that, we're going to have some aprons in the room. The reason is like if the patient, in spite of all these things, insists, we're going to provide it because that's their final ultimate. Right? And so that's very, I think that's why I wanted to ask that question because that's a very practical approach. Because, yes. you know, even though you say, okay, we should throw out all the aprons and then there's no issue, no one makes a mistake, yeah. it's not going to happen overnight, no. perhaps. And again, if the patients are really insistent, that's probably a good point. Then be very careful putting the yeah. things in place. But yeah. And in fact, that is one of the things which I was happy because the writer asked me about. Um, the, art, the, the focus about patient shielding has been with x-rays and fluoroscopy, but nobody talked about dental. And when the that's why the writer wanted to focus on the dental uh, dental issues. They talked to me because when we with the recent NCRP report, we have we know approximately about 375 million dental X-rays are taken in the country in 2016, and we need to educate the, uh, bring them to the whole same conversation so there is no confusion among everybody. Let's see what Brittany says. Brittany, I think you may have misunderstood. Let me see what she's saying. We aren't doing nothing. We're choosing proper technique and collimation. That is something. There's no doubt. It's just. You're supposed to be doing that. We agree, and but this is just one more thing. And I think, again, it's one of the interesting things I think about radiology, and it, which just says a lot about our sure. profession is whether you're technologists or the radiologists, that we, we are constantly looking at doing things better. And yes. just because we've yeah. always done it one way, if the science changes, we yeah. need to change with the science. That's exact. And Brittany is, is on the spot. And in fact, that's more right. Collimating in the right way and using the right technique is more important than anything else. However, because people are used to seeing the extra weight on around the patient, they we go to you know, the radiographer is going to get a questions, and only by educating and providing this answer will ultimately help to transition with no use of this. Okay. 
All right, well, thanks very much, Mahesh. And actually, less than 24 hours from now, we're going to be back speaking about dual energy. But I thought we both thought this would be a great time because it's such a hot topic and there seemed to be a little bit of confusion. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, thanks for clarifying it. And if you have any questions, just uh, send them off to Mahesh. And, uh, yeah. and I, I really appreciate it and thank you for this opportunity because these things are very important with multiple approaches to answer the questions. Great. Thank you. All right, have a great day, everybody. See you later.